Hello and welcome back. This time we're on lecture 12b and we're going to cover the topic of color. This may sound familiar since we talked about color back in the Photoshop section of the class too, but specific to Illustrator there's a few differences. Uh, one that's not different is what we'll review at the first and that's uh, not just modes but spaces and profiles too. Um, that's similar across the board throughout a wide variety of applications, just uh, color science in general. Swatches, spot colors, and rich black are the main topics that I want to hit you guys with today. So pay attention there and open up Illustrator and definitely follow along. These are concepts that you're going to want to be pretty familiar with. So uh, pay attention and try things out, experiment, and get familiar with the settings and options and locations for these things. So color models or modes are mathematical systems for creating a whole bunch of other colors from just a few, three or four different colors. So cyan, magenta, yellow, and black can be combined on a sheet of paper to make blue and fuchsia and turquoise and whatever other color you want to name, you can make a lot of those different things using a combination of just those four colors. RGB works the same way. In an 8-bit file, we can make 16.7-ish million different colors from just three colors, which is pretty impressive, right? So naming all those colors is impractical. I'm terrible with names of colors myself. Uh, numbers work a lot better. So assigning numerical values to all those different colors makes it machine readable. So a computer can understand what those colors are and reproduce them. That's the purpose of a color model. A color space is a way of communicating about that color model. So things like Adobe RGB 1998 or sRGB, those are color spaces that allow us to use a color model. Color profiles are specific to a device. So I can actually use a piece of hardware to measure the performance of my monitor's color or to read color patches off a sheet of paper and build a profile. So I can document the performance of a device and the characteristics and behavior of certain types of ink on certain types of paper, for example. And then I can save that information in a table and use that table to make tweaks so that if my printer is not printing pure red when it should be, I can tweak the settings to send the right values so that it does print red when it should be. So that's the purpose of a profile. Swatches, moving on, are specific to Illustrator in this regard that, um, well, in Photoshop, you have a photo, for example, with a certain color in every single pixel. And you can modify those colors, yes, but you don't have to choose them all. In Illustrator, you have to choose every single color that goes into your document. That can be a lot. And you find yourself needing to organize that somehow. And the swatches panel is where you do that. So on the top, that graphic you see is the swatches panel. And swatches are simply named colors um, and gradients and patterns as well and tints too. Um, Swatches are specific to your document. So what you see in the swatches panel is going to be what is in your document that you have open at the time, uh, for the most part. Swatch libraries are little swatch panels, basically, with set color values in them, depending on whatever somebody decided to build. So there's like an Earth Tones swatch library and a corporate swatch library. And these are just colors... Um, you know, swatches, named color values that somebody decided to put into a library. And you can make your own libraries and save them too. Um, you can get to that under the window menu. Go down to the very bottom to swatch libraries and you'll see you can choose different ones like textiles and web and so on. Anyway, those are different swatch libraries you can access. If you don't see any colors in your swatches panel, you can add them by opening up a swatch library and various other ways we're going to talk about it here in a minute. Um, so let's look at the swatches panel in detail. There's a lot going on here. Um, definitely follow along, open up illustrator, play around with these things. I'm just going to go over basically the name and a little bit more of the button or the icon or the graphic, um, and leave it up to you to do the reading of course, and try these things out and get familiar with them yourself. So a spot color we'll skip because we're going to talk about that in a couple of slides from here. Process color. It's simply a color made using a build of those three primaries. So whatever color mode you're in, RGB or CMYK, um, the process colors are red, green, and blue, or cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, so on and so forth. Um, those process colors are values, like you see the third one down, that kind of pinkish color. It says R equals 237, G equals 30, and blue is not fitting on the screen there. 
that's a process color um, because it has color values that are used to build that or it's a color build or a process same thing process color color build I'll use those terms interchangeably probably um, the none little swatch there means just what it says you click on that button on an object and it's going to remove a fill or a stroke or a pattern or whatever else is in that and it's going to make it empty so it'll just be an outline registration this is kind of a print centric thing i can apply a registration mark or a registration color wherever i want but that swatch is going to apply all the colors of that process so red green and blue cyan magenta yellow and black on every single plate if you don't know what a printing plate is or how process printing works, CMYK printing, um, you'll get that in GIT 250 if you haven't already. Um, we're not going to get into that too much here, uh, but understanding what a registration mark is for is important. You don't want to use that registration swatch anytime you want black in your image. It's not the purpose of registration. We'll get to that in a minute. The CMYK and RGB symbols there, E and F respectively, are going to vary depending on whether you are in RGB or CMYK mode for your document. So if you change the document color mode, those symbols will change. So um, they're just indicators of whether you are in the same mode as the swatch is, if that makes sense. Again, switch the document color mode and you'll see that those symbols change. Those symbols are either there or not there, depending on whether you're in list view or thumbnail view. So over to the top right of the swatches panel, you see there's kind of a list view icon and a grid view icon. Toggle those back and forth and you'll see what I mean between list and grid view. G, the swatch library menu. That's how you, another way you can access besides going into the window menu of the menu bar. You can click on that and access a bunch of different swatch libraries too. H, um, I'm not going to go into that too much. I definitely want you to experiment with those. You'll be surprised at the functionality. There's a lot that you can do with the uh, color themes panel. It lets you choose and build color palettes. Um, so dig into that one. Uh, that's about all I want to get into it right there. There are videos and tutorials and on descriptions that you can look up and read more about it. Um, if you go to color.adobe.com, you should be able to try it out there online too. It is a synchronized thing between your different applications and Creative Cloud account. You can even access this uh, color themes tool in some of the apps like Adobe Capture on your mobile devices. You can take a photograph of something or load a photograph from somewhere else or load a JPEG of a document that you like and basically rip off all the colors out of that in a custom color palette that you can synchronize with all your devices. Kind of, kind of handy. The... Um, Add selected swatches and color groups to my current library. That's a long name for a tiny little button there, but basically I can select a whole bunch of swatches. It's going to add them to a library, a Creative Cloud library. If you're not familiar with libraries, the nice thing about them is that they are synchronized across devices, across uh, applications, and across documents. So the swatches that you see here right now on this panel are specific to the document that I have open when I took that screenshot they are not going to be there necessarily unless I save them in a library uh, when I create a new blank document. I'm going to have to go through and pick all those swatches all over again, which is tedious. So it's very helpful to save your swatches. Um, so show swatch kind menu. That one should say menu. Sorry about the typo there. But that's just going to let you sort based on spot colors or global colors or whatever kind of swatches you're working with, patterns or tints, so on and so forth. You can make groups just like in the layers panel in Photoshop or layers panel in Illustrator for that matter. You can make groups, name your groups, be just as organized here as you are everywhere else. It's going to save your bacon. You can have hundreds of different colors in a document or more, and it gets very complex. And so organizing those with layer or layer groups, <laughs> swatch groups or color groups, I should say, becomes a uh, important skill to have. New swatch. We'll look on the next slide and look at the new swatch dialogue. When you're creating a swatch, you have some settings that you can choose. Um, and then you can obviously delete a swatch by just highlighting it and then clicking the delete or dragging a swatch or a swatch group onto that trash can icon. Okay. So when you create a new swatch, you get this window. It's also the swatch options dialogue. So if you want to create a new swatch or you can double click on a swatch name or go back to this slide let's look and there's again that uh, swap swatch options button k is grayed out right now you can click on that it's going to bring up this window 
you can name the swatch. By default, it's going to be named with the process colors for whatever mode you're in. In RGB, the name is going to be R equals and whatever level of red there is and green and blue and so on. If I'm in CMYK, it's going to give the CMYK percentages for whatever color build that I chose. So dropping down that list for color mode, you'll see that there's indexed and all the other different grayscale and whatever color modes you want to pick from. Uh, the two big ones that we're really concerned with here in this class are RGB and CMYK. RGB is for digital displays, emissive color. Uh, CMYK obviously is for print where you're using ink on a substrate. So choosing that is going to be important because it's going to affect how colors reproduce. If I'm working on a CMYK document, I want my colors to be in CMYK mode so that I get accurate representations when I'm applying those colors. So be aware of that. Under color type, you have the option for process color, but I can drop that down and I can also choose spot color. We're going to get in more detail on what a spot color is. Uh, on the next slide, but just so you know, this is one place where you can choose to set it as a spot color. Global color, this one's very useful actually. So global color allows you to, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to make an analogy here, but it, it's kind of like a smart object in Photoshop. It's a linked object. So if I update one instance of that color, it's going to update all the instances of that color. So let's say I have a design and I'm using a, uh, a global color for a design element on a poster. And on that poster, I have some um, color bars and colored boxes and maybe a color that's being used in a logo and some in the text. And it's all the same color throughout. Rather than modifying each of those individually, I can assign it as a global color. And when I update one instance of that, it's going to update all the instances of that color. Hopefully that makes sense to you. I want you guys to try this out. Uh, open up a document, add some text or an object, make a square or whatever you want to do. Um, add a color to it and then go in and make that swatch a global swatch. Duplicate that object as many times as you want. And as long as it's still the same global color, you can double click on that swatch and change the color here in that new swatch window. And you'll see that it's going to update and change it in all the other um, instances of that color usage. Okay, spot colors. This is good to know. This is especially handy for printing. Uh, not so much for web, <laughs> unfortunately. So on the bottom left, you see a, a swatch book. This is a swatch guide or a color guide. Pantone specifically is a company that makes um, these color books. And you may have seen these before. If you go to Home Depot and the paint section, you'll see all those different colors of paint. The purpose for that is so that you can look at that color of paint in a specific environment. These Pantone matching systems, our PMS system, PMS book is allowing you to look at a certain color tile and compare that to a printed piece or choose a color based on appearance under certain lighting or for whatever reason. So you have these values. Those are named values and you can buy pre-mixed ink that is that exact color. So if you're talking about printing, usually we're making all our colors using a mixture of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black in a half tone screen on paper. That's a complex process and getting it to be accurate and reliable and consistent across different types of paper, um, in different environments, different printing devices gets complex. And it's not always the most reliable way to get the same color. If you're a brand like uh, Coca-Cola or even ASU, for example, you have maroon and gold. It's important that that maroon and gold look the same on envelopes, letterheads, football jerseys, uh, coffee mugs, mouse pads, whatever it is that's being printed. It needs to have the same exact color. Spot colors is the way that you do that. So rather than fiddling around with cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, you can choose a spot color and order a pre-made canister or carton or whatever type of ink it is that you're using. And it's going to be that exact color without having to worry about half tone patterns and all that kind of stuff. It's also more economical because again, we're not laying down four different colors. We're just laying down one every time we run a sheet. So faster, more economical, more consistent, a lot of benefits to using spot colors. Lastly, rich black. So rich black as opposed to poor black is just a build of CMYK colors that gives you more density throughout your blacks than if you would just use black ink. So black ink in and of itself, because of the nature of subtractive color, 
is going to still reflect some light. And so you're going to end up with gray coming off of your paper. If you were to add some cyan, magenta, and yellow, in addition to that full black, it's going to increase the density. It's going to absorb more of the visible spectrum and give you a more uh, pleasing, solid, dense, rich black. So that's important. If you want to try this out sometime, I'm sure you can send something to the print imaging lab. Those of you that are here local, otherwise you might try this out on uh, your inkjet printer at home. You might even get the same results, depending on how your printer driver works. Sometimes they do it for you. But anyway, it's good to know that you need to use rich black if you want your blacks to look proper when you're printing. Um, those values, 60, 40, 40, 100, um, aren't going to be universal. Every print facility or print service provider is going to use different values for that potentially. They're all in that ballpark. Uh, typically, you'll have places that go 60, 50, 50, 100, or 50, 40, 40, whatever it is, but you'll want to consult. Communication is the key. Check with that print service provider or print facility and find out what their values are for rich black, and you'll be good.